Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show, where we look at the history of political polling in the UK. The very first general election polls were for the 1945 election, where wartime leader Winston Churchill was ousted in what was seen as a shock result. However, it wouldn't have been as great a shock if people had placed confidence in the Gallup polling for the News Chronicle, which had been showing landslide-level Labour leads for the previous two years. Indeed, Gallup's final election poll was only one point out for both Labour and Tory. After that auspicious start, there have been many polling setbacks at UK elections, notably in 1970, when the polls misled Harold Wilson into dashing to the ballot box, and 1992, when John Major defied the polls to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. However, with modern statistical techniques, the posters claim that they get more elections right than wrong. From the earliest coverage of television elections, the posters themselves have become the story, with Sir David Butler and Robert Mackenzie pioneering the celebrated swingometer. Their modern equivalent is Professor Sir John Curtis, who reigns supreme as today's TV polling guru. He joins Alex today. But not everybody takes the posters at face value. Online commentators in particular lambast the mainstream media's abuse of polls in their coverage. Again, there's nothing new in this. In the 1945 election, when Gallup was correctly predicting a Labour landslide, the Daily Express posters were forecasting a dead heat. Alex speaks to James Kelly of the Scottish website Scott & Goes Pop. All this later in the show. But first, to your tweets, emails and messages in response to our show to last week. William Nicholl says, yes, excellent show. Time the countries of the world were left to solve their own problems, as you rightly mentioned. Money used for war, instead used for improvement and ordinary people's quality of life. Ivan Eldrick says, sensitive and reasoned analysis by Peter and Alex. Much better than the dog whistle reporting we see on many MSM channels. Gordon McKenzie says, Always enjoy listening to Peter Oborn. Honest observations and always to the point. Teresa says, Peter Oborn is excellent, very informative. Mohammed Abdullah says, why did Teresa May feel so badly as Prime Minister? She speaks a lot of sense as an MP. Doan says, USA cannot betray the slogan, nobody left behind. Where are they now? Bob Howie says, this is what hope looks like. Most empires have invaded Afghanistan through the ages because it was a trade gateway all failed. The Americans are only the latest. If the West stopped trying to make the Middle East a Western society, they would have the only hope they can have and not the hope of escaping it, as this latest excursion has proven. Professor Sir John Curtis is today's uncrowned king of the TV posters. Alex interviews him about the long history of political polling. Professor Sir John Curtis, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Nice to be here, Alex. Let's go back to almost the dawn of political polling in the United Kingdom, the 1945 general election. Now, here was a situation where the News Chronicle, one of the great papers of the day, were featuring Gallup polls for two years before the election. Virtually everyone showed a, a Labour landslide lead, but nobody, but nobody believed that was possible. What was going on? Well, the truth is that this was the first election at which... Um, opinion polling was taking place. The previous one, the general election, of course, had been back in 1935, and the advent of Gallup's polls uh, really dates from the late 1930s, uh, particularly in the wake of their success in forecasting that Roosevelt was going to win the 1936 US presidential election when a now infamous readers poll done by Reader's Digest uh, suggested that he was going to lose. That was when Gallup really gained their reputation. But the 1945 election, uh, just after the Second World War, was the first opportunity for Gallup to do his polling in the UK. Now, of course, most people thought that because Winston Churchill was prime minister and Winston Churchill was the person who had delivered a victory for the United Kingdom uh, in the Second World War, that therefore, of course, he would be re-elected as uh, prime minister. But, of course, the electorate decided otherwise. And that, in a sense, therefore, helped to cement the idea that opinion polls could indeed sometimes tell us something that we wouldn't otherwise know. Not that opinion polls have always been believed ever since. I certainly can remember on many occasions before the 1997 UK general election, where, of course, the Labour Party also got a landslide. But 
uh, partly because of what uh, the polls had somewhat overestimated Labour's position in 1992. Lots of people did not believe that Labour was going to get a landslide. But again, on this occasion, at least the polls got it right. So what in recent history has been the greatest polling disaster? I mean, what has been the occasion when the, the pollsters, or most of them, or perhaps even all of them, had egg all over their faces? Yeah, well, there were three of those undoubtedly um, edged on the hearts of any opinion pollster inside the UK. The first is 1970, the election that Howard Wilson called quite suddenly uh, off the back of a rise in Labour's opinion poll standing. Um, and the opinion polls kept on suggesting that he was going to win. Actually, some late polling, particularly one poll done by Opinion Research Centre, suggested that maybe there was a late swing and maybe actually uh, Ted Heath was going to make it. Well, indeed, Ted Heath did make it, and that resulted in the first substantial inquiry into why the polls got it wrong. And the answer was essentially was, yeah, indeed, there was a late swing. And you have to remember back in those days, opinion polls were being conducted by... Um, interviewers going out and knocking on people's doors. So they couldn't be done at the last minute in the same way as they can be now and are done essentially over the internet. So that was the first one. The second one was 1992, um, when the opinion polls uh, seemed to suggest uh, that perhaps the Labour Party was at least going to deny the Conservatives an overall majority, maybe would have a hung parliament. Um, in the end, uh, the Conservatives got their fourth term. The reason there perhaps was essentially to do with the fact that the samples were not necessarily as accurate as they should be, and that perhaps in particular they oversampled people in living in social housing. And then finally, 2015, where again the polls suggested that perhaps we we're going to get a hung parliament, and then in practice David Cameron got an overall majority, uh, and that uh, undoubtedly a, a very substantial exercise headed by Patrick Sturgis now at the LSE on behalf of the British Planning Council said basically the samples were wrong. In particular, one of the difficulties that began to rise by 2015 was that um, the Labour Party was a lot more popular amongst younger voters than it was amongst older voters. A big age gap now in how people vote. And one of the different things that polls find it difficult to get right is who's going to turn out to vote and who doesn't. And younger voters are less likely to vote. So I'm, it's pretty clear that at that election, the polls underestimated the age differences in turnout. In other words, uh, they overestimated the proportion of younger people who were going to turn out and vote, because that's the, the younger people whom they could get hold of said they were going to do. But their peers, who the polls didn't get hold of, stayed at home, some of them. And therefore, the end ended up overestimating Labour's vote share. So three great disasters written on the hearts of pollsters. One, by the way, that is not a disaster, but is often cited as the 2016 EU referendum. Actually, some of the polls for that said that actually the Leave side were going to win. And if you take all of the polls that were conducted during the EU referendum campaign, slightly more said that Leave were going to be ahead than Remain. That always looked very close. It was close. It's just, that, again, I think in part, nobody could believe that the country would vote Leave. Therefore, the polls that suggested that we might were discounted. Now, I remember the 2015 election. I was rather counting on that hung parliament that the polls were, were, were forecasting. But given all these changes and all these inquiries, uh, is that impossible now? Is it going to be plain sailing for pollsters from now on? Have, they, have you no. ironed out all these difficulties? No, I mean, the, 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 the honest truth is, Alex, that, I mean, opinion polling is always a difficult art um, it, the, the circumstances change. I mean, again, you know, one very simple thing. Um, if we um, go back 30 years or so, um, whether or not people voted Conservative or Labour, and at that date will allow me to point out that for the most part, that's what most people did, even in Scotland. Uh, you know, basically working class people were much more likely to vote Labour, middle class people were much more likely to vote Conservative. Those days are over. In the 2019 election, um, Labour was no more popular amongst working class voters than it was amongst middle class voters. And the Conservatives were probably slightly more successful amongst working class voters than Labour were. Largely, though not entirely, the result of Brexit. Now, that changed circumstance means that pollsters who used to spend a lot of time making sure they had uh, at least you know, the right number of middle class voters and working class voters in their polls are complete, that's now irrelevant. On the other hand, 
whether or not you've got a degree or not now matters quite a lot in the wake of Brexit. But actually getting accurate information about somebody's educational qualifications is quite difficult because there is so many qualifications, particularly if you're thinking about an electorate that's been educated over a 50 year period. Getting accurate information about that is rather difficult, but that's now something pollsters have had to start to grapple with. In other words, what they're trying to get at changes over time. And at the same time, methodology changes over time. So we've already said it's now mostly done over the internet. That has lots of advantages, but it has disadvantages. Not everybody's on the internet and not everybody's willing to deal to answer internet polls quickly. And that's some of the downsides. Um, but, you know, um, uh, until really the late 1980s, it was all being done face to face, so called quota sampling. So the, the methodology changes, but the circumstance change. And then, of course, in somewhere like Scotland, the party system completely changes. And Scotland is now, of course, dominated by the SNP. Um, and so, therefore, again, the circumstances change, what you're trying to measure has changed, and therefore the challenge changes. And how the posters. Uh... Not necessarily in election polls, but in the between elections. How, how do posters protect themselves against uh, nefarious newspapers who, who might present a, a marginal change in polling as if it was some dramatic effect? I mean, going back to 1945, uh, while Gallup were forecasting a Labour landslide, miraculously the Daily Express were forecasting a dead heat on polling. So how do posters protect themselves against nefarious newspapers? Well, this is uh, undoubtedly something of a potentially quite difficult area. I mean, I can tell you as President British Polling Council, what we do is that we do now require all our member companies and basically all of virtually everybody who does opinion polling in the UK is signed up to, uh, to its uh, rules. And one of its many rules is that every time an opinion poll goes out, we remind people, the polling company reminds people, look, yeah, you know, opinion polls, are within about four points of the true value of about 95% of the time. But, you know, if the movement between two poles is, you know, less than four points, you know, it may just simply be the random variation to which all polls are subject and nothing really may necessarily have changed. Well, that's what the pollsters say. But there is no doubt that news values tends to dictate that, you know, even a, a rise of a couple of points um, it will get headlined, um, particularly even worse, um, you know, if the Conservative lead in the opinion polls uh, uh, drops by two or three points, you know, it will be suggested that, you know, Boris Johnson is uh, potentially in trouble or boost for Keir Starmer. Well, actually, uh, two or three movements on the lead is something that could very, very easily happen as a result of something else. Uh, but the truth is, Alex, the pollsters try to keep people honest by the way in which they report their polls, and they do uh, all the time get, provide a health warning, but it's very difficult to stop the um, newspapers, particularly in the headlines, perhaps claiming more for what their opinion polls say than perhaps that some of us who were wanting more ju judicious uh, suggest is perhaps wise. Coming up after the break, Alex continues his discussions with Professor Sir John Curtis. Welcome back. Alex continues his discussions with Professor Sir John Curtis and is then joined by James Kelly of the blog Scott Goes Pop. Uh, tell me a little about uh, Professor Sir John Curtis. I mean, did you grow up looking at David Butler and Bob McKenzie and the swingometer and saying, my goodness, I want to do that? Was, was it always your ambition to become the number one political pundit for pollsters? Um, no, but um, what is true is that, shall we say, I had an unusually early interest in politics and in how people vote. So my first political memory is the death of Hugh Gaitskell in 1963 and the subsequent leadership election that Howard Wilson won against James Callaghan. And that's the point at which I started reading newspapers and you know, took an interest in this leadership election. I then remember being allowed to stay up by my parents. So this is what, age nine, 10, for uh, the 1964 election programme, which of course was David Butler and Bob McKenzie. And the cliffhanger. Um, indeed, uh, and I remember following the cliffhanger the following day. 
Um, but I was allowed to stay up for a while um, until you know, 10 or 11 o'clock. Uh, so I saw the beginning of that program. So I was watching it and I certainly followed that cliffhanger. And fast forward, when I became a graduate student in uh, 1976, my supervisor was indeed uh, Sir David Butler, as he now is. And so it's the same person who indeed was you know, one of the two television gurus. So I actually have been behind the scenes at each and every general election since 1979, but for a long time, basically behind the scenes and then started doing local elections for pretty much every uh, round of English local elections from 1981 onwards. So I've actually done over 40 years of elections. I'm now, I think, the longest running person on the BBC crew now that David Dimbleby has finally retired, because 1979 was David's uh, first one. Um, but um, uh, most of the time, actually working on the production side, which actually I think is much more fun. Um, but eventually, more recently, I've been dragged much more into the front of camera. Uh, not least, of course, because that, that um, independence referendum for which you had a certain responsibility, um, where, of course, you know, Scotland's a very small place and anybody who could say anything about what was going on in the referendum was much in demand by any television station that was going. So that undoubtedly uh, raised my profile. So um, the answer is it's um, serendipity of the people who I knew early on in my career who got me inside a television studio. And then after that, gradually, people deciding to put me in front of camera as well as behind camera, and therefore uh, my becoming a uh, relatively well-kept face. Well, I, I'm pleased I've helped provide a, a boost to your television profile, uh, uh, John. It, of all that time, do you have an absolute favourite election? Uh, is there, oh, yes. Uh, of, of all that experience, is there something you can pick out and say, yeah, I'm glad I was covering that one? Yeah, I'm, I'm undoubtedly my favourite moment of uh, all the various general elections I've been involved in is, is 1997. And it is uh, the Portillo moment. It was the moment that Michael Portillo lost his seat. And not least of the reasons why... I remember that is that um, you know, I was again indeed sitting in my bunker. I was doing what I've been doing at a number of elections, which was uh, analysing the results as they came in and uh, telling people like David Dimby and um, uh, the late Professor Anthony King, who was the BBC's front person for a long time, a very urbane and very, very good broadcaster. Um, but I was doing a lot of the, the, the analysis behind the scenes and feeding them lines about what was going on, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I had a BBC producer uh, with me called Sean O'Grady, who's long since done a, had a stellar career on The Independent. Um, but you know, Sean's job was to keep on prodding me to be doing this, that and the other, to be uh, informing the programme. And Sean was telling me uh, not long after as well, you know, what more have we got to say? And I said, Sean, sit down, shut up. We are not going to get anything on air for the next two hours. This is high political drama. Um, and until that is played out, nobody's going to care tough and save me about the fact that the swing is slightly greater in the north of England than it is in the south of England or whatever. So that's undoubtedly, I think, the most dramatic of nights, partly because of the fact that so many people lost their seats, uh, but also because so many people couldn't believe that that could possibly happen. Professor Sir John Curtis, polling guru extraordinaire. Thank you so much for joining me in the Alex Salmon Show. Not at all. You're welcome. But not everyone is uh, as confident in the, the art of uh, political polling and its usage. I'm now joined by James Kelly of the, the blog Scotland's Pop. James, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Hi, Alex. Good to be here. How are you? I'm very well, but your blog has a note of scepticism about opinion polls, or at least about the, the use of opinion polls. I mean, what's, what's all that about? Well, um, obviously, I'm a pro-independence blogger in Scotland, and uh, in Scotland, we have a problem with the media, which is overwhelmingly anti-independence or sceptical about independence. Almost the entire mainstream media, with the exception of one newspaper, is, is against independence, and they're the ones that are commissioning the polls. And so you're going to get a, an agenda creeping in. You're going to get, you know, omissions, you know, questions that are asked or that aren't asked. 
or that if the, the question goes the wrong way, maybe those results will be downplayed, maybe results will be misinterpreted slightly. So it's, it's, it's more the kind of the relationship between polls and the media that I think are the, is the problem in Scotland. But you're not suggesting that YouGov or the, any of these other highly reputable polling organisations are, are distorting the information, are you? I think I think sometimes the information comes back and the media distorts it. Um, you know, numerous examples of, you know, for example, a, a newspaper editor took uh, a result which only applied in the run-up to the 2015 election when the SNP won by a landslide. He took uh, the results of a poll that only covered Labour-held constituencies, and then he put it into the uh, an, a predictor which covered the whole of Scotland you know, for national results, and then presented the seats projection as if it was a national result and people pointed out what he'd done but it was they're oblivious to it it was just just bulldozed through so you, you kind of put nonsense and you get nonsense out and the media do have this habit of misrepresenting polls to suit themselves sometimes in quite a you know it's not even you could it's not even you could say it was a misinterpretation it was just it's just wrong what they're, what they're actually doing they make they make factually inaccurate claims about their polls does any of this make a difference? I mean, your example from the 2015 election, uh, the, one of the unionist newspapers distorting the results of a, a single opinion poll, it didn't do them any good. The, the SNP still won that election in a, a, a landslide. So, I mean, what does it matter? Been the odd distortion here and there. Yeah, I think this is the big question, whether, you know, this relentless distortion actually makes any difference or whether, you know, a run of poor results can make any difference, you know, as you know, in the run up to the 2014 election and, and, and run up to the 2014 referendum on Scottish independence. Certainly in 2013, there was a whole string of polls showing absolutely dreadful results for the Yes campaign, for the pro-independence campaign. And my concern was that that was sort of sucking the life out of the campaign and you know, people wouldn't really engage with the campaign because they're thinking, right, this is just something we're going through the motions with. This is something we already know the outcome of. And they were, people were probably approaching it in a very different way from they would, than they would from a, a genuinely competitive election or referendum. And I thought that might you know, make it almost impossible for Yes to make up that ground. But of course, as you know, that's not the case. And Yes did make up that ground. So perhaps it doesn't matter. But I, I still think it's a cause for concern because... That was never going to do anything else. If it, if it was going to make any difference, it was always going to harm the Yes campaign and not the No campaign. Well, I tell you a secret, James. I was hoping that the polls wouldn't show a, a Yes lead until the referendum day and we'd sneak up and catch them at the end. And it was greatly to our misfortune, in my view, as the leader of the Yes campaign back in the day, uh, that a Sunday Times poll showed yes ahead with 10 days to go. I, I'd have much rather that hadn't happened. So sometimes being behind in the polls is, is not a bad thing. I th yeah, I think that's a good point, as long as you're a little bit behind. You know, as long as, you're, as long as you're competitive, but you're not actually ahead, maybe that's the ideal place to be. But those polls in 2013 were, you know, showing anything up to a two-to-one majority for no. And I think when it's like that, when it doesn't even look competitive, people are just thinking, well, why would I even bother thinking about this? Because we already know the outcome. As long as it's competitive, maybe there is an advantage to being the underdog. But I think if you're that far behind and if you're being presented as being that far behind, potentially it's a problem. But haven't you got a foot in both camps? I, I know you, your blog regularly advertises so you can do your own polls. I mean, goodness sake, how can you criticise these dreadful pollsters and, and then be dipping into the whole thing yourself? Well, we have to even things up a bit, don't we? I mean, if we're having all these polls that are pushed from a sort of unionist inclined questions, we might as well do a little bit in the other direction and sort of even things up slightly. So that's, well, that's for being slightly cynical about it. Maybe that is one reason for doing it. But I noticed in your, in your blog, you've taken to, to using exaggerated uh, headlines. I mean, this, <laughs> this, is this your sort of uh, commentary on, the, <laughs> on some of the unionist tabloids, giving them a, a taste of their own medicine? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, like the Daily Express, any poll that comes out, regardless of what it shows, you know, bombshell poll, hammer blow for Sturgeon, independence, hopes dashed, shattered, annihilated, you know, so just, just a slight ironic response to that. So you've been doing the opposite then. <laughs> you've yeah, been yeah. saying massive boost for independence campaign, yeah, yeah, even yeah. if it's a 1% shift. <laughs> Absolutely, why not? But what would your advice be? I mean, to, to people reading your blog, I mean... Would you advise me to treat the polls with a pinch of salt or, or, or to say, well, over the piece, they, they tend to show trends that you should take uh, take notice of? I mean, what, would, what would your advice as a, a blogger be to, 
to, to people looking at uh, opinion polls? Sometimes what will happen is that, you know, for example, the independence question in Scotland, uh, you know, uh, an anti-independence client will come along, you know, like an anti-independence pressure group or something will come along, commission a poll asking a, a question that isn't really about independence. And they'll put out a press release showing, you know, dread, uh, terrible drop in support for independence and the newspapers will report that. You just basically regurgitate the press release and you find that actually the question asked was nothing about independence. It was a completely different question that was being presented as if it was. So you have to look at the, what the question is, I think, before you jump to the conclusions that the trend can be meaningful. So is there any truth in the rumour that Scott goes pop are going to commission a poll in independence which says that if you were persuaded that sometime in the future that Scotland would definitely be a <laughs> land of milk and honey with independence, would you consider voting for it at any point? Is that your question? That's a really good idea. That's, that's going to go into the next poll. <laughs> James Kelly, if Scott goes pop, thank you so much for joining me on The Alex Salmon Show. Thank you, Alex. The only poll that counts is election day. Well, so says every politician facing adverse opinion polls. But every politician pays heed to the polling and the polls can set the temperature of election campaigns. Particularly in by-elections, there are plenty of examples of single polls changing the entire mood of the election. And given the often shameless abuse of polling by a partisan press, it opens up the argument that polling should be banned in the immediate run-up to polling day. In reality, the art of manipulating poll results hasn't changed much since Sir Humphrey Appleby instructed the naive Bernard Woolley on how to produce the answers which were wanted in a classic edition of Yes Minister. However sophisticated the science of polling becomes, there will still be both forecasting triumphs and disasters, and pollsters will likely have a balance of plaudits and brickbats for some time to come. But for now, from Alex, myself and all at the show, it's goodbye, stay safe, and we hope to see you again next week.